Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who uh, haven't been around the last few weeks, uh, or maybe visiting us for first or second time or so, and you're wondering, descended into hell, what are they talking about at this church? Uh, we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed for the last several weeks, I think five weeks or so now, and uh, we've gotten to the part of the Creed where it says, he descended into hell, and on the third day rose from the grave, rose again, um, and uh, so we're going to consider those two concepts together today, uh, and so it should be fun and interesting, and uh, uh, my desire, my hope is to kind of, uh, do you remember when you were a kid and you'd have summer breaks? Anybody remember that? Some of you are kids and you are experiencing summer break. Do you remember ever your mother would offend you by suggesting you would think during the summertime? Like by reading a book or, God forbid, working your multiplication tables or something like that. It's like she read some, something, uh, nowadays read something online or she felt guilty, I'm not parenting well. And then all of a sudden it's like, we're going to the library, we're going to get books. And you're like, ah, well, I'm going to make you think today. I want you to think today. I want you to engage your brain today. For some reason, God gave you a brain. Um, And for some reason, he gave us a book. And for some reason, he wants us to think. Uh, These things give him glory. In fact, we are told to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so some of us are really good with the heart part, emotions and bubbly and, oh, I love Jesus and blah, 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 you know, and we've got little figurines at home and little plates everywhere and mugs that say these things and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Some of us are pretty good with our strength. We like to serve. We show up. We put things, we move things. We clean things. We take care of things and service is something that we love to do and we enjoy and we we love God well with our strength. Uh, Minds, however... Minds can be a difficult one, and I think partly a thing that glorifies and honors God is when we exercise our mind and we seek out the deep and mysterious things of God in His Word. If it wasn't for loving God with all your mind, I'm just going to be very honest with you today. I wouldn't be a Christian. I would find it boring uh, emotions, I cry and whatnot, but eh, I'm not into emotionalism. I don't trust my emotions, and I sure as heck don't trust yours. Um, I, I like to serve. It's okay, but it, you know I could take it or leave it. But my goodness, you get me in a room with some Bible scholars. You get me in a room. Uh, let's, let's get out of the Bible. You get me in a room with people talking about astronomy or physics you give me now math. That's just necessary. To explain astronomy and physics. That's why math exists. Uh, but you give me in a room with people who are busy thinking big, deep thoughts, and I come alive. I love it. And that's for me where my Christian walk. That's that's for me uh, what I most love and enjoy about being a pastor. About the scriptures. Before I was a pastor, my plan was to become. A, an Old Testament professor. Um, God derailed that. How did he derail that? We started having children. Um, and the prospect of lots of debt and studying for four or five years and then being an unemployed PhD with an Old Testament, I thought, nah, I'll go pastor somewhere because um, I to study the Bible. So today we're going to exercise our minds. Um, how we're going to do that? Well, first, we're going to read, we're going to say, we're going to recite the creed together like we've been doing in the last several weeks. And this week, as we, we recite the creed, whenever we recite the creed, we are pledging allegiance to these ideas, these beliefs, to Christ, to God the Father, to the Holy Spirit, uh, to the church, in a sense. But we are also renouncing things about our, our culture And so today, I want us to think about renouncing two things. One is postmodernism. 
renouncing postmodernism. Postmodernism has given us rise to our current debate about fake news. Uh, When liberals start asking what is truth and conservatives are busy arguing with liberals about the nature of truth and he did say that or he didn't say that or he did do that or he didn't do that. We live in a postmodern world where everybody's truth is their own truth. And that's a scary, weird world. And when we say the creed, we are saying God is truth. Christ is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. They have declared truth to this world. And so when we say the creed, we are rejecting postmodernism. We're also rejecting emotionalism. Emotionalism is the idea that your emotions tell you what's true. Your emotions guide you and direct you. If it feels good do it. And there is so much of that. If you have a Facebook account, you are experiencing emotionalism all the time. People rant, people rave, people write about their emotions nonstop there. And emotions have gotten exalted to a truth-telling arena. When we read the creed, when we recite the creed together, We're rejecting emotionalism because much of the Christian life, our emotions aren't in line with the truths of the gospel. Much of our Christian life is spent in suffering, in frustration, in if we're victorious, it sure feels like we're losing right now. (laughs) And our emotions aren't a good gauge for truth. And so in reciting the creed, we're rejecting those things. So if you'd stand, good, strong voice, we're going to read the creed together. I believe. All right, please be seated, and without further ado, let's dive in, right, to Descended into Hell. Any recovering Catholics with us today? We got a couple of recovering, wow, you're all seated together, so there's another one back there. Any recovering Lutherans here today? Okay, and you're kind of grouped with the Catholics, interesting. Uh, Yeah, um... You know, I did a lot of reading this past week and, and, and the weeks uh, leading up to this because uh, I grew up in a non-credal kind of church. Um, uh, we didn't say these things. We didn't do these things. Uh, but we did have an understanding of what it meant that Jesus descended into hell for some odd reason. And I'm sure the Catholics amongst us, recovering Catholics amongst us, amongst us they've got an understanding of what this uh, phrase means. Lutherans, I don't know what you might think it means. Uh, just thought I'd point you out as well. Uh, but this line, he descended into hell, does not occur in the scriptures. This concept, you can, it's difficult to find this concept articulated clearly in the scriptures. For the next few minutes, we're going to dive into a handful of scriptures, three scriptures that may be the backstory to this concept. I think the clearest backstory to this concept actually came out of a book called The Gospel of Nicodemus. And The Gospel of Nicodemus was written in the third century, dates back to the third century or so, and it did not make the cut for being in the Bible. Uh, But The Gospel of Nicodemus, you can read it, it's fascinating stuff. In The Gospel of Nicodemus, Jesus storms the gates of Hades and he rips the gates off of their hinges and tosses them aside. It's like, you know, bowed up, bad Jesus, right? I mean, Mr. T Jesus, and if you're familiar with the A-team. And Jesus shows up, and 
one of the questions that the early church had, one of the questions that I'm often asked by people is, okay, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Now, what about all the people that died before Jesus died on the cross for sins? How are they saved? How are they forgiven? How does that work? And so, pastorally, the gospel of Nicodemus kind of answers that question because what Jesus did was he stormed the gates of Hades, ripped the gates off their hinges, and then he took out of Hades Abraham, Adam, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, and the gang, right? And they all went and ascended with him to heaven, And that pastorally answered that question. That's how he did it. That's what Jesus was doing on Saturday. As the disciples and everybody was crying about it, oh my gosh, he died. Jesus is busy getting rowdy. It was like the commando raid on hell, okay, is what one professor describes it as. That's probably, uh, and by the way, some of you are going to walk away from this sermon going, man, I mean, that's all the imagery of that is just going to stick in your head. You're going to be like, that was so awesome, right? Remember, though, that's in the gospel of Nicodemus didn't make the cut for scriptures. Uh, there are a few passages, however, that theologians wrestle with and think, well, maybe this is the backstory for this uh, part of the creed. Uh, so the first one that we're going to take a quick look at is uh, Psalm 16, 9 and 10. So if you have your scriptures, I'm going to actually be moving around a little bit. So this is going to be like one of those sword drills when you were a kid. Maybe your church did sword drills. We did sword drills where it was like who could, who could find the passage fastest. Um, and then Jesus liked you more than the other people is, is really what happened there. So <laughs> anyways, uh, Psalm 16, 9 through 10. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Now, this seems like a very obtuse psalm. In fact, it was very obtuse until uh, Peter, in the first sermon following Jesus' resurrection in Acts chapter 2, quoted this psalm. Paul, in the book of Acts, also quotes this psalm, and they both say that this is a psalm that predicts, that prophesies the rising of Jesus from the dead. They both use it that way, that this is prophecy in the book of Psalms that says Jesus will rise from the, rise from the dead. It kind of sounds that way, right? You will not allow your holy one to decay. You will not allow him to be in Sheol. Now, one of the troubles with seeing this is the backstory for Jesus descending into hell is some of the concepts around this. And in order, in order to help us understand this, I have, a, I have a picture of what Jewish cosmology looked like. Um, Jewish cosmology, it's not really good, I apologize. We need to get a new lamp for our, our thingy. Um, Jewish cosmology, they saw the earth as flat. They understood the earth to be a flat earth. They understood it to be surrounded by waters. They understood that the heavens were on these pillars of the earth. And they believed that we lived like in a dome. Like the whole earth was surrounded by this big dome. And on that dome were the moon and the stars and the sun. They like rotated on that big dome. And then above those things, above the dome, was God in heaven. And there was the waters above. Remember Genesis? God separated the waters below from the waters above by a great firmament. And he called the firmament sky, right? And you're like, you're reading that and you're like, water above? I mean, what's wrong with these people? Well, what's wrong with them is they're not scientists. They didn't have a satellite. They didn't have photos of Earth yet. Nobody had gone to the moon. All these things that you're like, how stupid are they? The reason they were stupid compared to you is that they weren't scientific. They didn't understand these concepts. They did think the Earth was flat. Under the Earth was Sheol. And later on, we'll actually learn, even below Sheol was a place called Tartarus. Um, They had these worldviews. This was their idea. And so in Psalm 16, it says, you will not allow him to rot in Sheol. Well, Sheol's different than our understanding of hell. Sheol, for the Hebrews, is where dead people went 
both the righteous and the wicked. The wicked would stay and stuck in Sheol. The righteous had a hope that they would be rescued from Sheol and they'd be in paradise. Now, obviously we don't think like this. This is nothing like what uh, New Testament Christians, this is nothing like any of us believe today. But this is the worldview of Psalm 16. So I don't think that this psalm is talking about Jesus raiding hell, <laughs> like our friend Nicodemus and the Gospel of Nicodemus and how exciting he makes this all sound. A- another possible verse for the backstory of this is Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 10. If we read these verses, we see this is why it says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and now he's quoting, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And then parenthetical comment, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Here we get the language of descending, So that's where theologians go, huh, I was talking about descending. He descended into hell. But we also get Paul, who wrote this, clearly defining it as he descended to the earthly regions. So I think this is a better understanding of Christ's incarnation, that he descended from heaven and he became human. I think that's what this passage is telling us. Christ became human. It's not telling us he descended into hell, though Some use this as a proof text for making that point. The next passage is probably the most, well, one of the most weird passages in the entire New Testament. I've actually heard stories of pastors who would preach through 1 Peter and they'd skip this chapter because it's so weird. Why am I bringing it up today? Because I just am a glutton for punishment. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 or 18 through 22. Very weird passage. Let's try to make sense of this one. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Whew. Okay, Pete, what are you doing there? A few key concepts in that passage that are are irrefutable and easy to, to picture. Peter is clearly wanting us to think about whom? Besides Jesus, because we're in church. I know that's the answer for all the questions in church. Noah, right? Clearly, he's making allusion, not even allusion. He's mentioning Noah by name. He's talking about Noah. He's talking about the flood. He's talking about the ark. And then he brings in Jesus to that whole discussion about preaching to imprisoned spirits. Somehow, Jesus, when he was made alive, preached to imprisoned spirits. And so some read that and say, okay, the imprisoned spirits must be imprisoned in hell. So Jesus... After he was made alive, because it mentions he suffered and died, then after he was made alive, he went and he preached to the imprisoned spirits in hell. That makes a lot of sense. A couple problems with that possibility. One is the traditional Protestant interpretation of this passage is that Jesus Christ through Noah and through the Holy Spirit preached through Noah to the people while they were alive before they died. And now, at Peter's writing, they're imprisoned. See what happened there? So they're basically saying, Jesus didn't do this on Saturday. He did this while Noah was alive, because Noah, we learn elsewhere in the Scriptures, preached. The whole time he was building the ark, he preached for 120 years and had no converts. 
Sometimes I get discouraged preaching. Could you imagine? 120 years and nobody, ah, you're an idiot, Noah, keep building your dumb ark. 120 years, nobody listened. And so the Protestant tradition teaches that it was Noah's proclamation to those people who are now imprisoned spirits that Jesus spoke through Noah. We get this concept elsewhere through the prophets, the spirit of Jesus teaching through prophets, the Holy Spirit teaching through prophets. So it's not a huge stretch to see it this way. Ben Witherington, though, he comes along. He's a, he's a, a theologian. He comes along, and he and many other Bible scholars, eh, they're like, that's kind of a wussy way out of this thing. Ben Witherington, he sees that the issue is Genesis chapter 6. In the beginning of that discussion, the sin, what it's called by the Hebrews, the sin of the watchers, the sin of the fallen angels. And he builds this case because Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, mentions this issue. He says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment... Now, there's a couple interesting things in this verse that we need to note. One is, God did not spare angels when they sinned. Well, where in the Bible did angels sin? The only place in the entire Old Testament that you can point to that angels, plural, sinned is Genesis chapter 6. The only place. The word for hell, it's a bad translation, is actually the Greek word Tartarus. Peter could have used Gehenna. Peter could have used Hades, but he chooses this word Tartarus, not tartar sauce, by the way, Tartarus. If you know anything about Greek mythology, you know two things. Tartarus is a god, but Tartarus is also a place. Tartarus in Greek mythology, was a place worse than Hades. Tartarus was a place where the wicked experienced divine punishment in Greek mythology. Tartarus is also the place that the Titans are imprisoned. I'm getting some nodding of head from freshmen because they just studied this in school. Why does Peter choose this word? Why doesn't he pick Hell, Gehenna, the Hebrew word. Why doesn't he pick Hades? Why doesn't he pick Sheol? Why Tartarus? Seems like he wants us to understand something. What he's doing, I think, and what Ben Witherington and many other scholars believe is going on is that Peter is using a thing called typology. And typology, Paul uses this all the time. We're going to actually read a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 when we get to the resurrection part, the exciting part. When we get to that, he uses Adam as a type of Christ. A type prefigures something else that's going to happen later on. And Ben Witherington and other scholars, they argue that what Peter is doing here is typology, where he is seeing a particular prophet as a type. And that prophet is the prophet Enoch. Huh? Who's Enoch? Well, if you remember Genesis, there's this big, long genealogy. And in that genealogy, it says, Enoch walked with God and was no more. And so Christians believe that Enoch floated away to heaven. God took him away. He was righteous. He was a good dude. And he did not experience death. And during the second temple period, there was this text that was written It wasn't written by Enoch, but it was attributed to Enoch. And it's the book of Enoch. And in the book of Enoch, we get this very interesting story about the watchers and how God imprisoned the watchers from Genesis chapter 6. And he imprisoned them. And one of the things that the watchers did was they came to Enoch, who's a very righteous man. We know that from the Bible. It says that he didn't die. He walked with God and was no more. And the watchers, they say this, Enoch, 1 Enoch 6, 4. They, the watchers, asked that I, Enoch, write a memorandum of petition for them, that they might have forgiveness, and that I recite the memorandum of petition for them in the presence of the Lord of heaven. Now, 
This was written two, three, four hundred years before Jesus, okay? And this is Jewish people trying to understand Genesis chapter 6, trying to understand different parts of their scriptures. They're writing commentary. They're writing different things. They're also creating polemic arguments against the Greeks because the Greeks have all these mythologies of wicked, evil people go to Tartarus. The Titans of old are in Tartarus. And the Jews pick up these things and they want to talk about these things, but through their scriptures. First Enoch 13, 1 through 3 says this, And Enoch go and say to Azazel. So he goes to God, he takes this petition from these imprisoned spirits to God, and here's the answer from God. And Enoch, go and say to Azazel, you will have no peace. A great sentence has gone forth against you to bind you. You will have no relief or petition because of the unrighteous deeds that you revealed and because of all the godless deeds and the unrighteousness and the sin that you have revealed to men. Then I went and spoke to all of them together and they were all afraid and trembling and fear seized them. You see, basically God says, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, you're going to stay imprisoned. You're stuck. Tough darts. I'm not a merciful God to you, in other words. Now, it's interesting because Peter, I think, I agree with Ben Witherington and these other scholars, I think they're making a good case for this idea that Peter is using Enoch as a type. And Jesus, what would be an issue after you just got the snot beaten out of you, you got your beard pulled out, you got yourself beaten, whipped, filleted, crucified, what would be the issue from a unseen realm power's point of view? I bet you the titans in Tartarus, the watchers, according to Hebrews, are thinking, ah, we just killed God. We win. Jesus, though, Peter is arguing, did what Enoch did. He went back to Tartarus and said, nope, I win. I'm victorious. You're still defeated. You're still imprisoned and you're not getting out. And then Peter goes on and he says that every time somebody's baptized, every time somebody's baptized, that's where you get this baptismal language. Every time somebody's baptized, every time somebody comes to Jesus Christ, if you haven't been baptized, if you haven't come to Christ, you need to do this because every time you do this, it just smacks them in the face again. You will not win. You lost another. You lost another. You lost another. You lost another. Christ is more powerful than the powers. I think that's what Peter's doing there. So is that sending to hell? Well, no, that's a descent to Tartarus. (laughs) So we still haven't really gotten this thing figured out. In fact, lots of evangelicals, lots of churches have left. He descended into hell out of the Apostles' Creed. Now, why was I stupid and left it in? Well, one, I thought it'd be fun to preach on this because I really think these are fun passages to sit around and think about and they're, they're difficult and they're, they're fun to wrestle through and, and argue about. And it's just interesting, right? I mean, to me. Uh, but I'm a geek and I'm weird that way. But I think we also leave it in because when Jesus was on the cross, when Christ was on the cross, he cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. And in some mysterious way, on the cross, Jesus experienced two separations. He experienced one that all of us here present are waiting to happen to us. And that is the separation of our spirit from our body. Jesus experienced the separation of his spirit from his body. We call it death. And on the cross, Jesus experienced the separation of his spirit from his body. The death that we all wait to experience. But he also experienced a second death, which we have already experienced. 
And the death that Jesus Christ experienced on the cross, the second one, was separation from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And this is a separation that we've all experienced. We were born into the world with that problem. None of us have connected with God the way that we were meant to connect with him. And so Jesus, for the first time on the cross, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he all of a sudden, first time in his existence, experienced what is so common to us. Where's God? Why doesn't he show up? Why doesn't he do anything? This separation that we just know so well, but we were never meant to feel. Jesus, for the first time on the cross, experienced that. I like to define hell. Many theologians, many Bible scholars like to define hell as this. Hell is separation from God. Did Christ experience that? Yes. Why? Why did he experience that? Because it was on the cross that the Bible goes on, he uses languages like this, where it says, he became sin. He became our transgressions. On the cross, Christ was absorbing the sins of the world. On the cross, Christ was absorbing the sin of David and his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. On the sin, Christ was absorbing every sin of mine and yours. Every sin. And because of that, he was separated from God. I think that's why it's important to keep this in here because the work of Jesus is a descent from heaven. He descended from his heavenly throne. He came to earth and he worked these things on our behalf for our salvation. He was willing. (laughs) Could you imagine? He was willing to set aside the robe, the crown, the scepter, the throne for a cross. I don't know if I could make that choice. But Christ made that choice for us and descended into hell for us. All right, let's get to the more fun, exciting part. Hopefully that's helpful and exciting. Resurrection, right? Because it says he descended into hell But on the third day, he pulled off Easter. He rose again from the dead. You know, really what this does is it stamps God's approval on Christ's work on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he was exerting his allegiance. He was manifesting his allegiance to God the Father and the Holy Spirit to death. The night before, he had said, take this from me. Have you ever been there? Maybe your wife, your kid, your husband, your employer, they come and they have a really difficult conversation with you and you leave that conversation thinking, take this from me, right? So you go down to the courthouse to get a divorce or annul the marriage. No, hopefully you don't do that. Or you kick your kids out of the house. I hope you don't do that. Or you quit your job. Yeah, lots of us have done that, right? We try to find a way out. And Jesus had bad news from God. He knew that he had to die on the cross, this horrific, painful experience. More than that, he knew he had to be separated from God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he is pleading to the point that his perspiration is like blood. Take this from me. I don't want to do this. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die horrifically. Nobody wants to die excruciating death. Nobody looks forward to that. Jesus, even God in the flesh, did not look forward to this. And Paul puts it this way. He was obedient to death, even to death on the cross. Christ demonstrated his believing loyalty, his allegiance to God, the Father and the Holy Spirit, by going to his death, by allowing himself to die. And when he was raised from the dead, God is granting him the victory he won. God is giving him the victory over sin and death. God is saying, well done. You did it. 
You are allegiant to death. And Christ wins the victory, wins our salvation, secures resurrection. You know, this is our blessed hope. A few days we'll gather here. And it seems too often we gather here. Because none of us get out of here alive. Uh, I was talking to Javen recently. The, did you know that the, fun, the, the, uh, the uh, cemetery district had the nerve to purchase another field and to mark it out for graves? What do they think? That they're going to keep growing? I mean, Alco closed two and a half years ago. Uh, since we've lived here, uh, that filling station has been closed the entire 14-some years I've lived here. Sevy seems to be doing pretty well. But there's some empty storefronts. There's a feeling sometimes that are the industries in our community, are the stores, are the shops, are, how are they doing? And the cemetery has the nerve to think, we're going to expand business. We're going to take in more customers. We need more retail space. Oh, the nerve of those guys. Anybody else? I think we should write the paper. I think we should make a petition. I think we need a better business than a cemetery here. But you know, they're right. (laughs) They're absolutely right. It seems that hospitals and cemeteries aren't presumptuous in deciding to grow and expand their services. You and I will end up there. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. His resurrection from the dead is our blessed hope that we who follow Christ, who practice believing loyalty in him, we will rise from the dead Because he rises us from the dead. There's this passage of scripture. I can't say it any better than this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul gets on a tear. And he said, I I think this thing is like one sentence in the Greek. Paul, you know, uh, would not have passed English grammar probably. He says this, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. By the way, 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 42, get your Bibles, read it. There's things in here you need to circle, highlight, underline. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. What kind of language is he using there? Farming. (laughs) We get that. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised imperishable. In glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Have you discovered that your body is perishable? The older I get, the more convinced I am. Since when was sleeping a dangerous activity? Have you ever slept and woken up like this? Or this? And you're like, I was sleeping. Since when was sleep dangerous? When I was a child, I'd sleep on the ground. I'd sleep on the floor. I'd sleep on a rock. And I'd wake up and be like, all right, this is awesome. We're camping. Blah. Today, I don't want to go camping unless it's comfortable. Because sleeping is dangerous. This body is perishable. Sown in dishonor. Oh, my gosh. You've been around somebody who's passing? It's so dishonoring. I mean, your body just wastes away. It fades. You can't do anything for yourself. People have to give you ice chips because you can't even drink. Your mouth gapes open. You gasp for air. You can't respond. You just lie there. It's so... So revealing. So there. So just, ah. People come and go and deal with you and move you and prod you and bug you. and There's no honor in it. 
You know, Jesus experienced no honor in his death. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, before we, I, I want to stop here because some of you, when you read that, are, you're thinking, oh, so like we're spirits. No, you're, you have a spiritual body, but it's still a body. I don't get exactly how it works. I haven't seen one yet. The disciples saw one. They saw Jesus's spiritual resurrection body. He had a nose. He had eyes. He had a mouth, two ears. He had scars from his death. He could eat. Thank you, Jesus. Does that mean there'll be barbecue in heaven? You betcha. Right? He was, he was physical, yet spiritual. We're not going to be floating around on clouds, disembodied spirits. We're going to be physical. Our bodies will be raised. It's the only religion that believes that. Lots of religions believe in an afterlife, but they don't believe that this physical thing that you've existed in will have a six-pack of golden abs for eternity. (laughs) Which I'm looking forward to. While eating barbecue. How is that not the coolest? Right? So don't think spiritual and think disembodied. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Now here's where Paul gets into some typology. Now you know what typology is because we just looked at Enoch and Jesus. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. The second man, Jesus, is of heaven. As with was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. That's us. And as is the heavenly man, Jesus, so also are those who are of heaven. That's us who have faith in Christ. And just as we have been born, have the born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death? It's your sting. Oh my gosh, this guy's got the nerve to taunt death. How cool is that? How cool is that? You know, Paul says, that's your future. One of the things that I've started to to practice as a discipline, I got this idea from a pastor, uh, Matt Chandler. He started to try to see his life from this perspective. What will this moment look like 10,000 years from now? When I'm munching on the best taste in barbecue rib I've ever had with my golden six-pack abs, looking back at this moment in time 10,000 years from now, what will this moment be like? It'll It'll be like a dream. It'll be like a, this, this fuzzy, hazy, yeah, that was kind of painful at times. Yeah, that was awful sometimes. Yeah, that was horrible sometimes. But I'm eating ribs and got golden six-pack at. Why am I stick, stuck on that today? Uh, I'm ruling and reigning with Christ. I've been to Mars. I've explored Jupiter and its rings. Heck, I've gone past Pluto, which isn't a planet anymore for some reason. 10,000 years from now, when you're in your imperishable body because you have followed Christ, 
because you did not stop following Christ, because you did not desert him because some of his teachings are difficult, but because you remained faithful and loyal and true to him, because you were willing to count the cost to pick up your cross and follow him 10,000 years from now. Oh my goodness. You know, you can't take it with you, but you can deposit it forward. Everything you do in this life can be put on deposit, can be credited to your account in the distant, I mean super distant, future. And 10,000 years from now, you will reign and rule with Jesus Christ over all of creation. So let them build the cemeteries bigger. That's the only way we get out of this place. Why? Because you have to sow this perishable perishable body. And it's raised imperishable. It's raised in glory. All right. Quickly. Cemetery. How does this make us well-rounded Christians? You see, some of you aren't taking this resurrection language seriously enough. Part of the resurrection language that Paul employs is this. You have raised to life and have died to sin. How many of you feel that? How many of you experience that? How many of you are aware of that? How many of you do that where you have been raised to life in Christ and died to sin? Many of us need to spend today in front of the air conditioner wrestling, thinking, contemplating, meditating on that. What it means to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. You need to spend some serious time with that concept. Others of you, (laughs) you need to think about the fact that you will be raised that you'll be raised, your loved ones will be raised. And you need to think about that 10,000 years from now. What will this feel like and look like then? Clarity. <laughs> it's pretty much the same as last week. If you are in Christ, you are completely and fully forgiven. There is no sin greater than the cross. There is no sin more powerful than the cross. Question, the sins you committed in your life Were they before or after Christ's death on the cross? After. Not a trick question. You can trust your instincts, all right? (laughs) After. It didn't surprise Jesus. Not a single thing you've ever done shocked him. Oh my gosh. Well, I take that back, right? Everything. He knew exactly what he was getting into when he got you. He knew exactly what needed to be forgiven. He knew exactly what he was doing on the cross 2,000 years before a little you showed up in the world. Wee, wee, wee. Right? None of, nothing you've done has, has caused him to love you any less. And nothing you have done has ever caused him to love you anymore. He did this 2,000 years ago. And if you are in Christ, you're forgiven. (laughs) And some of you need to sit in front of the AC and you need to think about that all day long today. Community. If we're forgiven, then this is the priority uh, trait that shapes our community. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. It shapes our community. It shapes who we are in Christ. Some of you right now have to forgive me because I've gone a little long. Maybe I did that on purpose. Oh, think about that one, right? Would you have forgiven me had I not said you need to forgive me? Think about that. Counsel. How do we counsel ourselves with this? (laughs) It's pretty obvious, isn't it? But when I was a kid, we used to sing a song. It was by Bill Gaither. It was called Because He Lives. I I like that song. I was thinking about singing that song after church, but I'm like, no, I'm going to go long because I'm talking about he descended to hell and so we probably shouldn't sing it. So you just have to hum it on your way out of here. I miss that song. Maybe next week we should sing Because He Lives. I can face 
tomorrow. I mean, it's trite, but it's true. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't know what your tomorrow looks like. I don't know what your day after tomorrow looks like. I don't know what you have coming at you. I don't know what looms on your horizon. I don't know what scares you. I don't know what you're afraid of. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know the difficulties in your life. I don't know. But I do know that because he lives, you can face tomorrow. You see, the resurrection gives us hope for today and tomorrow because he he kicked the teeth out of death. <laughs> That's the worst that could happen to us. And Jesus, Jesus conquered it. Jesus beat it. Jesus descended to hell and on the third day rose again from the dead. And if you come back next week, you'll hear that he ascended into heaven. How cool is that? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Christ and his work. Man, we don't give it enough thought. It's so easy for us just to go through our life and think, ah, man, it's so hard, it's difficult, it's hot, it's no fun, it talks too much, it's going too long. Stop and silence ourselves, and we just need to fall down on our face in awe of Christ. And what he's done. The only one who punched death in the mouth and lived to tell about it. Father, thank you that that is our future. For those of us who are allegiant to Christ, thank you that that is what we have to look forward to. That this is not our home. It is only for a short time. And we will rise in Christ someday. Holy Spirit, make that so. Impress it on our hearts. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. My goodness, the peace of the resurrection. Is there any more? The peace of forgiveness, his work on the cross. What more could you want? May you walk in the knowledge of forgiveness and resurrection today. Amen.